Great. Um, thank you, Sayan, for a nice introduction. And um, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to talk about my research. So today's talk uh, uh, is going to focus on a class of uh, machine learning techniques, uh, two of my favorite ones, graph convolutions and uh, language models, um, and how we can use the combination of these two to predict a, a, a function of a protein, giving it sequence and structure. Uh, uh, also, I want to uh, focus on how we can, how, how these uh, techniques can allow us uh, uh, not only to predict the function, but also to understand the mechanism be behind each uh, uh, function and uh, how we can use them to identify the most important components uh, of the protein that contribute to, to its function. Um, so, um, more details about the, the stuff that I'm going to talk about uh, today, you can also find in this uh, uh, preprint uh, paper that is publicly available um, and it's online. Um, so, as you all know, the pr proteins are the most uh, versatile and essential uh, macromolecules of life. Um, proteins are responsible for some of the most important functions uh, in an organism, uh, such as uh, constitution of organs, so this is done by structural proteins. So here you have some examples of protein functions and proteins that are uh, uh, involved in this uh, function, such as binding, catalysis, which is very important for uh, uh, maintaining the um, uh, meta metabolism, which is, this is mainly done by enzymes. Uh, then there are proteins that act as switches so they can change the conformation uh, in the presence of other molecules. And in that way, they can control the uh, uh, cellular um, processes. Uh, so, so these are some of the uh, most uh, uh, widely known um, uh, biochemical functions of proteins. But um, how do we uh, uh, re represent the function and how do we use the function uh, for our machine learning models? So over the years, many biologists and computational biologists um, uh, came up with different systems to organize uh, protein function. So genotology is one of the one of the um, uh, widely known and used uh, uh, classification system. Um, there is also EC system where uh, uh, proteins and mainly enzymes are classified using EC numbers. So as I said, Go is widely adopted, and uh, proteins are classified uh, uh, protein classified using genotology. Uh, terms where there are all uh, there are about forty thousand uh, different code terms uh, and functions that are organized in a hierarchical way. So on the right side here, you see uh, just a subset of the molecular function branch of gene ontology. So gene ontology encapsulates functions for most prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms. And as I said, it's organized in a hierarchical way, in a way that you, if you go down the tree, you get to very specific. Uh, functions. If you go up the tree, you get to very general uh, functions, and this, as a consequence, has a formulation of the. Um, this affects the formulation of the of the protein function prediction problem to be uh, a multi-label classification problem, meaning that the protein that uh, is, for example, that has an ATP binding function assigned to it will automatically receive all the labels that are parents of that of that label in the co-hierarchy. Um, so as I said, there are other branches uh, of gene ontology. So here, this, it's only a part of the molecular function branch, but there is biological process and a cell component branch that describe different aspects of the protein function. So in the results that I'm going to show you, um, uh, we focus on, so we evaluate the model, or, uh, we evaluate our model on different branches uh, separately. So for molecular function, biological process, cell component, and also for uh, EC numbers. Uh, so this uh, uh, this figure here illustrates the need for function uh, for developing computational tools for function prediction. So here in in blue you see the percent the, the number of annotations that are uh, experimentally confirmed across many different uh, model organisms, uh, and in orange you see the number of these annotations that are uh, uh, electronically inferred, mainly by using uh, BLAST. So the um, as you can see, most of the proteins are not experimentally characterized. So uh, most proteins uh, are unknown or don't have any, uh, or only have general functions. So basically the goal of the, these computational tools is to assign more specific functions to, uh, uh, to these uh, functionally uncharacterized 
uh, proteins. We can uh, so for building models for function prediction, we could we can use different types of data, and uh, so we can use sequences, structures, and uh, networks, also text features. Uh, and based on these uh, different types of data, we can divide methods uh, uh, into uh, different classes. So there are sequence-based methods, structure-based methods, and network-based methods. Uh, sequence is always uh, uh, readily available for most of proteins. Uh, structure is not available uh, for many proteins, um, so experimental structures. But in that case, we can turn to, to some uh, tools for structure prediction, for example, Rosetta. Uh, and also there is a large number of uh, homology-based predictive structures. And uh, as of recently, there are many uh, deep learning tools that are proposed for structure prediction, such as AlphaFold and uh, DMPFold. So uh, in the next few slides, I'm gonna show you how our model uh, performs on experimental structures, but also I'm gonna show you how it performs on, on these predictive structures. And last but not least, the uh, networks are, um, network features are very useful. Uh, very indicative of a function. Uh, the, the, and uh, in some of my previous works, I focused on, uh, on, on this uh, type of methods. Uh, however, today I'm going to focus only on se sequence and structure, uh, uh, mainly because we want to build a very general model that can work on large number of proteins. And we know that networks are not uh, always available for many, um, many organisms. Um, so, uh, one of the widely known and uh, used tool for inferring function for uh, protein sequences is BLAST, as you all know. Uh, uh, however, with the advances in uh, deep learning, we, we see that many uh, deep learning architectures have been proposed for this uh, function prediction uh, task. So one of the most uh, famous one is the 1D CNN. Uh, so this is just a, a, an example of very general uh, CNN architecture. Uh, so different from the traditional sequence alignment based methods and also traditional machine learning methods, CNN can automatically extract function related features from a protein sequence of any length and map these uh, features directly onto the, any number of go terms or functions we have. Uh, very briefly, how do they uh, work? So they start by encoding uh, a protein sequence uh, using uh, one hard encoding features. So basically to each residue, we assign a 20 dimensional binary vector indicating the type of the residue. Uh, and then that uh, so leads to a construction of uh, L by 20 binary matrix. Uh, and then um, uh, so we apply, so the first convolutional layer applies multiple uh, filters, uh, uh, we can even apply multiple filters of different sizes that are sliding across the sequence and extracting the features. And we can apply multiple different convolutional layers that are there to build um, uh, different uh, hierarchical features. And then eventually this is followed by some uh, global uh, pooling layer, either global max or global sum pooling or global average pooling layer that constructs a fixed length feature vector for each sequence, for each input sequence. And then this uh, can be followed by some number of dense layers that map this feature vector to uh, go term probabilities. Um, so this is, as I said, very general architecture. There is a huge body of work that's been published in the last couple of years. Uh, they are highly recognizable by having the word deep in their title. Um, uh, so they, uh, so these are, they're all some variation of the architecture that I just uh, showed you in the previous slide. The most famous one is DeepGo. Uh, that's it's been trained on predicting uh, Go terms and we're gonna use DeepGo in our comparison study. But all these uh, papers show that basically they can predict function better than BLAST and uh, better than some traditional machine learning methods that require feature engineering because the CNN doesn't require any feature engineering can directly extract function related features from sequence. So if we go just back one slide and you see how the CNN uh, uh, performs convolution. So it convolves uh, residue level features over residues that are close to each other in the sequence. Uh, so, but uh, if you look at the structure, for example, this is an example of the structure of the protein. So you can imagine that there are residues uh, 
on, in the sequence that are actually close, that are very far away from the, each other in the sequence space, but that they end up close to each other in the 3D space. So for example, you can imagine a residue here in the purple area and a residue in the green area, and they can be hundreds of residues away in the, in the sequence space, right? But they're actually very close to each other in the structure space. And you can see this, you know, the, the best way to see this is by just computing a, a C alpha, C alpha distances between residues and threshold distance and compute a protein graph that is shown here on the right side. And you see here that, uh, you know, uh, by representing this structure as a graph, you have a direct link between the green and uh, purple um, residues uh, in the structure. So uh, if we want to define a convolution, we need, uh, so if you want to run convolution on this structure like this, so we need something that can generalize convolution operation from uh, uh, grid-like data structures like sequences to graph-like data structures. And that's exactly why we use graph convolutional neural networks. Uh, uh, and they're, they, they've been one of the very hot topics recently in many machine learning uh, uh, conferences. So this is just the statistics for the uh, ICLR and you see the, the, the large increase in the number of papers with the keyword graph convolutional neural networks over from year 2018 to year 2020. So they, 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 they are a very useful tool for extracting uh, features from many uh, different types of graphs for, uh, and they've been used for extracting features for, from uh, social networks, social graphs, uh, also other uh, types of molecules. So here uh, we wanna see how they perform for uh, this protein function predict prediction uh, task. So, um, so this is the pipeline of our method that we called deep fry or uh, deep functional residue identification. So the, the method is named because of the, uh, uh, the thing that I'm gonna talk you in the second part of my talk. Uh, but here, let me just uh, explain briefly how this uh, technique works. So uh, the input to deep fry is a protein uh, sequence and its corresponding uh, experimental structure. Uh, it has two parts. One is the, the first part is the uh, LSTM language model, which is only used as a feature extractor. So uh, for, from sequences. Uh, so the, uh, it's, uh, it, it comprises two uh, LSTM layers. So we, here we use LSTM uh, language model. So it has two LSTM layers that are processing a sequence from one end to another. And it's trained on, uh, in a way, to predict the next residue in the sequence, given all the previous residue uh, in the sequence. Um, so um, the advantage of our method is that this first part is a fully unsupervised. So you can, uh, you can train this language model on any number of sequences you want. So here, uh, this model is pre-trained on uh, almost 10 million uh, sequences from PFAM. Um, and then it's all, uh, it's uh, used for the second part of our method as just a feature extractor. So we put in a sequence uh, through the model uh, and then we extract the residue level features from the second LSTM layer of, of our model. So that gives us a residue level feature. So for each residue we have a, in this case, 256 dimensional feature vector. So these residue level features uh, and a contact map constructed from the experimental uh, PDP structure are passed to a first GCN layer. Uh, so the second part is a GCN network, graph convolutional neural network that uh, has three GCN layers. Uh, so the way that this uh, com graph convolution works is that it, it um, propagates features between, uh, for, so for each residue in the, in the structure, it propagates features between the neighboring residues. So three layers of GCN, uh, uh, basically corresponds to uh, convolutions that are um, effectively convolving features over third order neighborhoods of every node in the graph, so every residue in the graph. So basically all, uh, it captures all the features that are three hops away from each, each residue in the, in, the, uh, in the structure. And so this is followed by a global pooling uh, layer so we concatenate the output of each GCN layer, and then we have a, a global sum pooling layer that basically constructs a fixed uh, uh, 
length feature vector, and then uh, a couple of dense layers that just um, map this feature vector to go term uh, uh, probabilities. Uh, interesting. So the, the important thing to notice here is that in during the trainings, during the training of GCN, we fix the weight, the weights of the LSTM of the language model, right? So we only use L uh, LSTM as a uh, feature extractor. So um, so this way, the training the model in this way, uh, in this so, sort of uh, semi-supervised way where we have this model that is fully, uh, the language model that is fully unsupervised and uh, uh, the GCN model that is supervised because we, we're trying to predict functions of all, uh, leads actually to the, the uh, huge boost uh, in, in accuracy in the function prediction as you can see in the next uh, few slides. Um, so for benchmarking, we use uh, uh, we use uh, protein structures and protein sequences from the experimental structures from the PDB. So there is a huge number of structures and sequences, but there is a lot of redundancy between them. So we first remove redundancy. Um, so we basically uh, cluster the sequences and we take only non-redundant uh, PDB chains. So and also the chains that are uh, annotated. Uh, we, we retrieved uh, go term annotations from uh, structure integration with function taxonomy sequence database or SIFTS database. Um, so we also explored the possibility of including uh, pre B chains with um, uh, electronically inferred annotations because that, uh, in, that increases the number of uh, tra our tra uh, training samples. Uh, but we do it in a in a uh, 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 in a very careful way uh, in which we fix the test set uh, to have these three properties. The first one is that it's only uh, composed of uh, experimental structures or an experimental PDB structures that has only experimental annotations, and that has different uh, degrees of sequence and identity to the training set. So we explore thirty percent, forty percent. 50% and so on, but in most experiments I'm going to show you, we have only 30% sequence set identity to the training set. So um, for each PDB chain you know, in our training set, we, uh, we construct a contact map uh, by thresholding C alpha, C alpha distance using 10 angstrom cutoff. We also explored different cutoffs and different types of uh, contact maps. Uh, so the first results I'm showing you here. Uh, so uh, first, let me tell you, we use two different uh, types of measures to evaluate the performance of our method and also to compare our method to other methods. Uh, and these are uh, methods that are uh, commonly uh, used in uh, critical assessment of functional annotation competitions or CAFA competitions. So one is the protein-centric uh, FMAX score, which measures the, the accuracy at which we can assign go terms to a given protein. And the other one is the area under the precision recall curve, which is a protein centric measure, basically, which uh, measures the level of accuracy of assigning uh, proteins to a given go term. So the Fmax is computed by uh, computing precision recall curve. So for different uh, decision thresholds, we compute the average precision and average re recall. Um, and that's average over all proteins in our test set. And then uh, we compute uh, uh, F1 score, which is just a harmonic mean between, between the precision and recall, and we take the maximum. So we compute the uh, precision recall uh, uh, curve here, and along that curve, we take the maximum value, which, is, which corresponds to F max. So here you see the, um, the, these three different baseline methods. Uh, that are uh, sh basically showing the importance of language model features. So the first one is just the CNN, which is just trained on sequences. Uh, so that's shown in gray. Uh, we see the blue in blue is a GCN trained only on very simple uh, residue level features. So this is the same type of features that we use for CNN, this is one hot encoding features. Uh, and uh, we see the uh, GCN trained with language model features. And we see that basically that in that by taking into account the language model features, we actually can boost the performance of the GCN uh, uh, significantly in both uh, Fmax score and uh, which is basically indicated by both Fmax score and uh, AUPR value. 
So um, the first thing we uh, did was to also explore the um, how uh, the how well the method can perform or predict functions of on predicted structures. Uh, uh, this is particularly important because we are also using this method for the um, uh, for the uh, microbiome immunity project in which we are trying to predict the functions of uh, uh, microbial proteins uh, in the human gut. So uh, we conducted an experiment in which we first um, folded a few uh, folded a, a set of sequences using Rosetta. So this is done in collaboration with uh, a, a colleague from the Flatiron Institute, uh, Doug Brenfrew. So he, he ran Rosetta uh, uh, to predict the, the uh, uh, structure. So Rosetta takes as an input the, basically the protein sequence, construct the multiple sequence alignment, and then it, it computes the predicted contact map and together with the contact map and a set of fra fragments from previously ex experimentally determined uh, protein structures, it uh, basically searches the confirmation space and finds the one uh, with the lowest energy. So uh, in our experiments, we took, for, for benchmarking, we took the uh, top 500 data set. So these are hand, hand curated, high quality um, structures. So we folded them using uh, two techniques. One is Rosetta and one is uh, DMP fold. This, this is a very recently proposed deep learning based uh, uh, method for structure prediction. And for each sequence, we had also its corresponding uh, native structure, uh, so experimental structures from PDB. Uh, so, uh, and here you see the performance of deep fry on this uh, 500 PDB chains. So in uh, black, you see the black line here uh, shows the performance, the AUPR performance uh, on native structures. Red is the DMP fold, so deep learning, and uh, uh, orange is the uh, performance on Rosetta. We also compare this with just the pure sequence-based uh, CNN uh, method. And we see first that uh, basically any kind of structure, the predictive structure can uh, is still better than just running the CNN on sequence. And uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is that we see that the performance on this predictive structure is very, very uh, um, uh, similar to the performance on native structures. And this is uh, mainly because of the high denoising capability of uh, GCN. So the GCN that is trained on experimental structures, so the, from PDB is used here to for predicting this uh, functions of the structures of the uh, predicted structures, right? And uh, to demonstrate this, what we did was to, we constructed, so we extracted features from each GCN layer. So from the first, second and third layer, and then we correlated features extracted from the lowest energy structures with the features extracted from the native structures. And you see that after three layers of convolutions, these features are well co correlated, indicating that the model can actually um, significantly denoise this, uh, so, so it, can, it can remove the noise from this uh, predicted uh, structures. So this results encouraged us to basically also turn to other types of predicted structures and maybe considered uh, uh, including them into the training uh, procedure of deep fry. Uh, so we uh, looked at, at the Swiss model uh, structures repository. So uh, this uh, repository has a large number of uh, uh, structures um, that are covering the entire uh, Swiss broad sequences. Um, and they, the, so here you see the numbers across many different, um, so the number of these structures available across many different uh, model organisms. Um, so at, uh, one great advantage of using these uh, structures uh, uh, in the training of deep fry would be also to increase the coverage, the possible number of go terms that we can train the model on. So on the right, you see here that the, just the statistics or the, the number of uh, go terms of coverage uh, when both PDB and Swiss model structures are included versus just the PDB. So in, for example, these are molecular function and biological processes uh, go terms. Uh, so here the go terms are stratified based on the information content. So the higher information content, the more specific go terms we have. Uh, and we are very, very interested in the very specific go terms. So those that are basically down the tree in the hierarchy. 
in the Go hierarchy. Uh, so here you see that, that, you know, that by including Swiss model structures, we can actually have a lot of uh, specific functions. Um, so before training the model, what we did what, uh, was two experiments. So we uh, run just deep fry on Swiss model structures. And we run deep go. Deep go is a CNN based method that I uh, mentioned. Um, uh, so this is just a sequence based method and blast, right? So on the left, you see this uh, AUPR uh, curves for deep fry, uh, deep go and blast. And you see that basically training deep fry on the basically the same number of uh, structures as a, a deep, deep go, we can uh, achieve a better performance. Uh, but on the right side, you see, you know, how the, you know, the deep fry model is compared, deep fry model trained on PDP, on Swiss model, and both PDP and Swiss model structures, how do these models compare uh, to each other. So you see that by including more training examples, um, uh, we can achieve higher performance. Um, and uh, so uh, just one more time to note here, so, so to say here, basically the, the so the, the test set on which we uh, evaluate this performance was always fixed. So we had experimental structures only and only experimentally uh, uh, annotated routines. Uh, so, and then we were exploring the performance when we include uh, only this Swiss model or uh, homology based predictive structures into the training of the deep fry. Uh, so the test set was fixed basically for all these uh, baseline uh, models. Um, so uh, next, we uh, we wanted to compare the performance of deep fry to other uh, state of the art and also uh, baseline methods. So on the right, you see um, comparison to of comparison of deep fry um, to blast baseline, which basically just transfer the function based on sequence similarity. FFPred is a, a type of a sort of traditional machine learning model. Uh, which is uh, 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 just a, a set of SVM uh, uh, classifiers that are trained on features that are uh, extracted from manually extracted from protein sequences and structures. DeepGo is the CNN based method that I already mentioned. And uh, FunFAMS is uh, uh, one of the top three performing methods in all the CAFA competitions. And it works by, uh, it's an annotation transfer method that transfers the annotations from protein families. Uh, and uh, the prime method that is trained basically on both structures and sequences. Uh, so you, you can see here that basically uh, by comparing deep fry, uh, we achieve higher performance than deep go uh, and also blast and FFPred and very comparable performance. We achieve very comparable uh, uh, performance with uh, FanFAMS. And this is on the test set that was chosen to have 30% sequence identity to the training set. Uh, here, the, the the reason for a very low performance of FFPred is because this method can only perform on a subset of Go terms. Uh, so we have actually much larger coverage of Go terms with DeepFry and, and, and DeepGo. And on the left side, you see the the how these top three methods uh, perform when we have different sequence identities. So on, on a different test set chosen to have different sequence identity to the training set. So with 30% sequence identity, we, we see like that, uh, uh, that deep fry and fun fans are actually, uh, you know, very, they have very comparable uh, performance, but on the higher sequence identity thresholds, deep fry outperforms uh, both uh, deep go and um, fun fans. When we look at the individual go term performance um, and compare deep fry with deep go, so basically GCN versus CNN, so here in red, you see uh, individual AUPR values for basically, uh, so AUPR values for individual Go terms. Uh, in red, in blue, you see the, perf the AUPR values uh, of uh, uh, computed by using uh, DeepGo, so the CNN-based method, and you see the difference in the third panel between DeepFry and DeepGo. And if you correlate this uh, difference with the average sequence length per Go term, what you can see here is that for, let's say, sequences that are approximately, um, they have a length below 400 residues, you see that there are some functions in which CNN outperform GCN and also some functions in which GCN outperform CNN. But for longer sequences, you only see that GCN 
uh, uh, mostly for most of the functions uh, is outperforming uh, CNN. This uh, thing is also very visible when you compare it with CS uh, with the solar component go terms. So again, we compute the AUPR for each uh, CC go term with using uh, using GCN and using CNN and compute the difference and correlate that with average length. And here you see that above 200 residues, you cannot achieve uh, the CNN cannot uh, achieve higher performance than GCN. And this sort of correlates with the, what I said in the beginning, which is that the GCN can actually convolve uh, over residues that are really far away from each other in the sequence space um, because they, it takes into account the 3D structure, the proximity in the 3D structure, wh whereas the CNN cannot do that. And that's clearly indicated here in this performance plot. Now I want to uh, uh, tell you something about, uh, this is a, a fun part of the uh, deep fry. So how do we go from, uh, so most functions um, are assigned to the entire length of protein sequence, even though we know that uh, uh, a lot of binding functions, for example, perform, uh, so the, a lot of proteins, binding proteins, uh, uh, perform functions through a proxy of very few residues. So how do we uh, go from uh, protein level to region level predictions. Uh, and here we, we, we're gonna demonstrate this by borrowing a technique in um, image uh, processing, uh, so called class activation map. So if you have a CNN that is trained on a bunch of images, uh, uh, what you can do when, once, you have a, once you have a network that is trained, you can propagate from your label back to the input space to see what are the most important parts of that input that contributes to that to the correct prediction of that label. So here you have an example of Australian Terrier uh, image. So that's basically classified as being uh, Australian Terrier. But if you uh, propagate, so if you compute the class activation map, which basically takes the derivative of the uh, that label, the output label with respect to the uh, features from the last uh, CNN layer, um, you can identify exactly what pixels on the image contribute to the uh, to that uh, correct prediction of that label, right? So, uh, and you can, in that way, you can obtain something called class activation map. And this is shown as a, a, a color plot here, which basically highlights the pixels that are corresponding to the dog on the image. Uh, so only that, basically, only that region of the image contributes to the uh, correct prediction. So um, we did basically here the same thing for proteins. So here is an example of the protein that performs uh, calcium ion binding. Uh, so the model, so this is a test protein that was predicted to perform calcium ion binding. And it's also is, uh, so it correctly predicts the calcium ion binding. Uh, and when we compute the class activation map profile that you see here in the top uh, panel, uh, you see that there are two regions that are identified by this technique. And if you map these two regions, so basically these uh, residues with the highest activation, if you map them back to the 3D structure, you see that there are two regions that are highlighted in the structure. And it turns out that exactly these two regions correspond to the calcium ion binding um, uh, pockets on the structure. So this was very interesting to us, especially because the model was not aware of this information. So the model was only trained on protein structure, so only the contact maps of the protein structure was not was given to the model, uh, not the ligand binding uh, contact map. So, and the model was still able to identify this uh, correctly, these uh, regions corresponding to uh, binding sites on the structure. So um, this was an indication that we can basically go from this, uh, uh, that we can identify uh, functional uh, residues on the, on the structure. So we performed this for also different uh, types of functions. Uh, and the way we evaluated this was to use uh, the information, we use the information from BioLeap. BioLeap is a database that has this uh, ligand binding uh, um, information about uh, uh, which residues in the structure are binding uh, different ligands. And uh, then we can overlap uh, or we can compute some measure of uh, performance of how well the class activation profile correlate with the, uh, you know, uh, ligand binding profile from BioLeap database. And we use, in this case, uh, ROC curves. 
uh, to quantify the, the, the level of the overlap between these two. And uh, you see here for the three different functions, GTP binding, uh, sorry, the DNA binding, GTP binding, glutathione transferase activity, also calcium ion binding, you can see the ROC value uh, between the salient uh, or the class activation map profile and the bio profile. Um, we systematically investigated this for all, like all the binding, all the functions related to binding. So this is an example of DNA binding. Uh, uh, so these, all these proteins are our uh, test proteins and for which we uh, correctly predicted the function. And also then we computed this class activation map. And you can see that, you know, all these regions, they correspond to uh, DNA binding. And here in the corner, in the uh, uh, bottom right corner, you can see the ROC curves, uh, which are showing how well we can recover the ligand binding information from BioLib. So this is a DNA binding. So this is an example of GTP binding. This is heme uh, binding, uh, iron sulfur cluster binding, um, magnesium ion binding. So it's it, the model basically showing the you know consistency in the way you can identify these uh, functional regions. Uh, uh, so here's my favorite calcium ion binding. It's basically even so. The first thing we, we see is that, uh, I mean, this is true across many different uh, folds. So the, the model can identify these functional regions, but also like if you have, let's say, uh, two ligands inside, it can, it's also able to identify both uh, regions in, in, in the structure. Um, another evaluation strategy we use is temporal holdout. So this is more like a, a, a type of evaluation that's done by uh, CAFA. So here we took the annotations, uh, SIFTS annotations. So these are PDB chain annotations from SIFTS in May, 2019. And uh, so this one snapshot of the that database and we took the snapshot of the database uh, from January, 2020. And if you compare the proteins and annotations there, you could see that uh, there are proteins that did not change, the annotations of which that did not change. So we call these train proteins. There is a set of proteins that had some annotations in 2019 and then they gained new annotations in 2020. So we use that as a validation set. And there is a set of proteins or PDB chains basically that did not have any annotations in 2019 and then they gained new annotations in 2020. So we use this set to evaluate. So this is a test set uh, we use to evaluate uh, our models. Um, when we run the analysis, we also we, we, we again show that deep fry is outperforming both. So the deep fry, which is GCN based method, outperforms CNN, deep go, and also blast baseline. But the most interesting thing we we found is that uh, basically there is a set of proteins that we correctly identified. So we correctly predicted functions uh, using only deep fry, and that's only possible with deep fry because if you look at the blast scores, they're very low. So you could, you cannot do any transfer uh, of functions using BLAST and it's also very low score for deep go. So the, here basically this, this is a set of proteins that uh, uh, for which we basically the, show that the structure information is very, very important because the correct predictions can only be done with deep fry that takes both contact maps and sequences into account. Uh, also, uh, we, we identified a huge number of and annotated PDB chains. So these are the chains, uh, th so these are the structures with no uh, known function, uh, or at least the function was not assigned using sequence. Uh, so I just wanna mention one example here. So this in panel D, so that's the protein that was that was basically uh, with no uh, known function. But uh, basically when you look at the PDB file, it has, uh, uh, it has a DNA and a calcium ion binding inside indicating that it's a DNA binding and calcium ion binding protein. So there's actually a huge number of PDB chains with the same property, which no function was assigned, but actually you can infer the function just by looking at the PDB file. And um, interesting thing is that the RD prime model was able to predict the function of these proteins. Uh, and also when you map back the, uh, uh, so when you perform class activation map, you can find the regions that correspond to calcium ion binding. So the, these two non-overlapping region, one that is corresponding to calcium ion binding, or sorry, the metal ion binding, and the, the other one that corresponds to uh, DNA binding. Uh, 
so there's a, of course a huge number of, so, so there, there's some number of, of PDB chains that we annotated uh, sort of uh, using uh, deep fry and this data will be available publicly um, uh, very soon. Uh, last thing I want to say is, um, so this is an ongoing project in our lab. So we also, we are considering on, uh, so uh, I showed you here that a language model can be used for predicting uh, functions, but we also use it for uh, predicting contact maps. Specifically, we want to replace this uh, computationally expensive multi pulse sequence alignment step here by using a language model instead. Uh, so uh, you can, uh, for example, a model that was pre-trained on a huge number of sequences can then be used for any downstream task. task. Here I showed function prediction, but we could also use it for contact map prediction. So we can train it on a bunch of uh, uh, contact maps. And then once we have the train, we can then use it to predict uh, contact maps for any sequence. So here are some of the examples just to show you how this works. But the main reason why we're doing this is because we want to replace this part of the deep fry that requires basically um, a contact map, experimental contact map, but only with the predicted contact map by just sort of having the contact map predictor built in to this architecture. Um, uh, last uh, but not least, I want to mention that basically uh, we also have a deep fry web server. So you can take uh, your um, uh, a FASTA file of your favorite protein or a PDB file of your uh, structure. It can even be a predicted structure and you can uh, upload it on a, a, a DevFry uh, web server and you can predict the function. You can get a list of Go terms in all three branches and also uh, EC numbers. Uh, and uh, um, one interesting thing about it is, is that you can also, um, so for each function, you can also visualize your um, salient uh, residues, so by using this class activation uh, technique that I uh, showed you. Um, uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, uh, my collaborators from the Microbiome Immunity Project. I didn't have much time to talk about this, but uh, we are using this method for also as is, uh, uh, to predict uh, functions of the microbial proteins. So. Um, so the, the special thanks goes to Tommy from Broad Institute, Tomas and Brin from San Diego, also to my PI Rich Bonneau from the Flatiron Institute, uh, and also uh, Chris, Daniel, uh, Julia, and uh, Doug. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to take any to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vlad, for the interesting talk. So I think I see that there are a lot of questions actually on the Q&A. See so if you can have a look at it. There are around eight questions over there. Okay. So the first, so, so should I read them? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So, Ah, uh, so the first question is, uh, what would be a good training set for function prediction uh, with Go terms? Is the data set uh, unbalanced? So the training set that we use here, as I mentioned, is uh, uh, a set that we obtain for, so the Go term annotations for PDB chains that we obtain from SIFT's database. The data set and, and generally the pro problem of function prediction uh, suffers from this uh, unbalanced uh, problem. So basically, you have some well-studied go terms and uh, uh, some not so well-studied go terms. So that results in in, in an imbalance in the number of training samples. But the way we address this issue is uh, first we try to focus only on uh, some specific go terms. Uh, so only the go terms that have at least thirty um, um, or even fifty. So for different branches, uh, uh, training samples. Uh, and then again, we don't go up to more than, let's say, uh, 5,000 uh, uh, proteins per Go term because we don't want to get to very uh, general Go terms. So that's the first thing. And the second thing in the training and the loss that we're using, so we're using binary cross entropy loss, we, are, we, have, a, we have different weights that we assign to different Go terms, uh, giving higher weights to underrepresented functions. So these are the, basically the two strategies that we use to address this. Um, class imbalance issue that we have that we see with go terms. 
The second question is, can deep fry process uh, multi-mirror or very big proteins? Uh, the question uh, is in the line if there is a limit on size where it can work the best. Um, so right now, uh, right now the model is trained only on PDB chains. So I, I would say um, there is no limit in, in the length. You can put any length, but I think there is some uh, sort of distribution of lengths on which we train the model, right? And, and, and that goes like on average, it's, it's like 500 residues, let's say. So I don't know exactly what the behavior of the model would be if you upload a very, very long protein sequence. Uh, I think we are still uh, looking uh, into that. Um, uh, so how many proteins can you upload to the GCN? Is there a limit on the number? I know I know in CNN, I can be a, a, that can be a limiting factor for training when you try to go to the atom level on uh, interaction. So I don't think that there is any limit. Uh, so I don't know if you are, I'm, I'm not uh, sure uh, if this question is related to a, a web server or, um, or a, a model, but basically we can train a model on any number of uh, structures. There is no limit there. Uh, and I don't know exactly what the limit for deep fry is. I will have to check that. Um, but, or you can just try it and try to crash the web server uh, because it's still work in progress. Uh, uh, also, so the so next question is, could this model be used to predict loss of function in protein for specific mutations? No, unfortunately not. So this is not, um, uh, so this is uh, predicting loss of function is a slightly different problem than 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 uh, than the go term prediction. Uh, so uh, uh, honestly, we haven't tried this. Uh, so basically, if we put in the the the, the, the function, so if we put in the sequence uh, with some mutations in, can we see the can we see actually this in the in the in the go term assignment? And probably yes. And that can probably be used for, um, uh, for uh, you know, uh, identifying loss of function, but we haven't really tested uh, this. Um, are you, so the next question, are you predicting go terms as output to the GCN? And isn't this a problem given the relatively small training set size of proteins with resolved structure? Yes. Uh, so, um, also, do you take into account the relationship between go terms in the output, or do you treat them independently? We treat them independently. Uh, uh, so we don't really. Uh, uh, but in the post-processing stage, we propagate uh, the predictions to the root term. Uh, and the answer to the first question is basically related to the second part of the of the presentation, where I was showing how. So the training size is, is small if you only take the PDB chains, but that's why in the training we added Swiss model uh, homology structures that increase the training set from basically uh, 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 30,000 or 40,000 PDB chains to 250,000 uh, structures. Okay, so including the, the this uh, predictive structure can drastically increase the training set and also the go term coverage. Uh, what are the classes of the softmax softmax layer in the LSTM model? What is its role? Oh, there are, there are no classes in the softmax layer of the LSTM model. The softmax there is used to predict. So the classes are uh, actually the classes are uh, residues, residue types. So there are twenty possible uh, residue types. So the softmax is predicting the type of residue uh, there because the model is trained to take as an input sequence and predict the next residue in the sequence. So it, uh, by predicting the next residue, you're predicting one of the 20 possible residues. Okay, so that's what the, the, the purpose of the softmax layer is in the LSTM model. Uh, have you tried integrating structure and sequence data? Yes, so this, this GCN model is actually um, uh, designed specifically for that. Uh, so it has a uh, uh, contact maps. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and basically uh, node level features, which are coming from sequences. sequences. So in, in, in a way, GCN is already integrating both uh, sequence and structure data. 
is the uns so the next question is is the unsupervised LSTM part of the deep fry an embedding layer? Yes, it can it can be seen as, as an embedding layer, but like more, much more sophisticated layer. So in the in the second part of the question is can you conceptually compare it to something like word to vec for uh, AA sequences? So it serves to reduce the dimensionality of the input data and assign similar sequences and similar pitch vectors. So as I said, yes, it's, it's a form of embedding uh, layer, embedding layer for sequences. We haven't compared it with word to vec. Uh, I think, um, yeah, that, that would be an in, uh, interesting to, to do. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so the so the basically the the LSTM is just used as a, as a feature extractor. Uh, we only compare it with very uh, basic one hot encoding. Uh, uh, features, right? But comparison to other methods can definitely be done, and uh, word to vec is definitely one, one of these uh, things. What what do the LSTM features correspond to? Did did you try compare it to, to hand engineer chemical features? Yeah. So I consider this one hard encoding features that are just saying the type of the residue uh, as uh, hand engineered features uh, that you are basically constructing from the sequence. Uh, we also compare it to basic like um, biochemical. Um, properties so so hydrophobicity uh, uh, charge and uh, stuff like that so basically concatenating it in one hard encoding features with these biochemical features we did that comparison I didn't show that in presentation but again LSTM features are uh, are outperforming these uh, hand engineered chemical features uh, the next question is how are you dealing with uh, variations in sequence length padding the max sequence length yes we do the padding I forgot to mention that. Yes, we have sequence. So we take uh, sequences uh, of length between 60 and 1,200 residues. So that's the range. And uh, in that set, we have, uh, of course, variable length sequences. The way we do padding is on the mini batch level. So that's uh, 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 so that's one thing. So we don't do the padding on the entire data set. So basically, after so when we load the mini batch, then we do the padding. And so that basically, the mini batch is of different size each time when you're doing the the gradient descent. Uh, have you uh, have people attempted to solve the, this problem using CNNs with attention layers instead of uh, GCNs as well, in the hope that they can learn which residues are likely to be in close contact via attention, if that's feasible at all? Uh, I think that's an interesting suggestion. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not aware of any work uh, doing uh, this combination. But again, that would require learning this, uh, learning the, 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 the contact map or the learning the relations between residues. And uh, I guess the, the goal of this work was not to learn this relationship, but actually to just take what we have in the, in the, in the structure, right? Because we already have in the structure these uh, connections and uh, that can be done just by using uh, GCN. Um, can you build a language model protein level representation and uh, bypass the GCN? What is the advantage of having the GCN in between? Ah, okay. Uh, so this um, uh, so this certainly can be done. That's one of the baselines. I didn't show the results for this, but we, we performed a simple experiment where we just take the LSTM and map it directly to Go terms. And uh, we show that basically uh, that is performing really well, definitely better than uh, uh, using GCN and uh, some simple uh, engineered features. But basically having both language model and contact maps always leads to the best uh, performance or this is actually showing or indicating that having contact maps is the, it's always uh, leading to higher performance. And as I showed you one of the examples of this in temporal holdout, there, there are cases where we were not able to predict any function just by taking sequence into account, right? So you, we needed a contact map to accurately predict the function. Um, the next question is, uh, you can also, um, you can uh, uh, also concatenate maps to the protein level representation. Oh, um, yes. So any other protein level representation can be concatenated later on in the layer, but I mean, that's the possibility, but we haven't done any experiments uh, with that. The next question is what what is a, a deliberate choice of the LSTM over 
by LSTM. Aha, okay. Did you consider by directional approach? Yes, we did. Um, uh, so you, uh, and we also consider other types of language models. So there is a transformer architecture now that is, that's very popular. Um, but this is something that we, it's, it's still an ongoing uh, process. So basically considering uh, other types of language models, including the bidirectional LSTM that basically process the sequence in the reverse order. Uh, I guess this, this will be included in some of the uh, future work. Um, and the last question is, can you talk a bit about the type of the, of output uh, the model generates and how it affects evolution? Evaluation, sorry. Um, is a high prediction score for a single go term enough? Do you evaluate how many of the go terms belonging to the protein are ranked highly? Okay, so this is done by these two measures that I mentioned. One is the Fmax score that basically ranks the protein, uh, ranks the go terms assigned to a protein, and then computes the precision and recall, and then uh, average between precision and recall. Uh, and the other type of the technique I mentioned is the uh, function centric, where it ranks proteins for a given go term, it ranks proteins, right? But uh, basically, it's hard to compare this on an individual go term level. I showed you one type of comparison, but most of the time when we're comparing methods, we average across all the proteins in the test set and all the go terms in the test set. Um, so comparing it on one single go term is not definitely enough to say whether one method is better than the other. So we do this. So we do we, we have to average uh, across all the go terms, specific and general, both specific and general that we have in our test set. Uh, 